Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. And I don't know where you are in life tonight. I don't know where you find yourself in your little dash, right? In life. But I'm here to tell you that God is pursuing you. I believe that there is people here tonight that out of your mouth you have said, I am alone. And you literally feel alone. And I'm going to tell you that that's a lie. You are never, if you are a child of God, that reality in Jesus is that we are never alone. You might feel lonely, which is different than being alone. I think in the last two and a half years out of my mouth has come out, I'm alone. And out of learning to bake my own cake, which I'm going to show it to you, I have found myself so in love with Jesus. And I know that if I feel in love with him, I want to tell you that he is madly. Maybe that's not the proper word, so don't send me an email. You don't say madly. Just take it. But he is pursuing you with all of his heart. You need to know that before the foundation of the earth, he already had a plan of redemption for you and me. Do you know that? Before Adam and Eve, do you know that you were on his mind? Do you know that you were going to go you were going to go through many things, painful things, wonderful things, and you know that he had you in mind? And the moment that Adam and Eve fell, that's the moment that he put his plan already working. So working our own salvation, it's wonderful, but it's painful. I was going to finish with and show you my, um, because I'm going to get into the word, right? And I, and I want you to feel like a professional person, but I want you to receive this word today. My prayer is that you open your eyes to believe and to be able to see beyond your moment. My prayer, and I've been praying the whole day because what I'm teaching you is what I'm living. So I'm not teaching you. I know the word. This doesn't come from... Um, Theosophically, whatever. That's not even a word, huh? <laughs> I have become so creative that I, you know, God gives me new words. <laughs> Which is okay. It will be the Virginia Dictionary for next year. But I want you to know that God wants you to leave this place tonight with great hope. And maybe you like me, you hate working out, but believe me, working out our salvation, it's where worth it we're gonna have fun tonight but let me show you and I felt like I needed to wear this apron again because hey this is my first cake and guess what I got the ingredients right mind you I don't know how to do none of this so I I sent someone and they said what well, was Lexi I said Lexi you need to go buy me oops all of these things and she said, Pastor, are you sure you have everything? I'm like, yes. I triple check already the ingredients, right? And so I decided, you know, I'm just going to write my message. And then at the end, I'm going to bake, right? So I was about to bake, and I was missing the eggs. <sighs> Only me. Then I was going to put in a beautiful platter. I don't suggest that you, that you taste my cake. I wash my hands, put my hair up. No, I didn't. I, I let it be because I cannot put my hair up. But I did wash my hand. I didn't use my mouth to open anything, right? So I was very careful. I had witnesses there with me. And then I believe that we live in a cultural, in a world, in the church, that we want things to happen fast, right? So I was like, how long is this going to take? You know, like I was already stressed just for the time. I said 1.30. So every, every probably 15 minutes, I will open the... Uh, yeah, I know. I didn't know. You're not supposed to. <laughs> I, you're not supposed to, right? Well, the directions didn't say don't open it. 
And I'm literal. It doesn't say do not open the oven every 15 minutes. So I figure, you know, I just want to share this is going on. And so I put the timer and everything. Okay, be kind. Um, so it's a pound cake, mind you, right? One of the qualities of a pound cake is supposed to be what? What? Well, it's supposed to be soft, right? It's soft. It's delicious. This is my pound cake. I call it the brick of life. <laughs> True story. I was driving, so I was being very careful. So you already touch it. You don't have to, but if you're brave, you can, tell, you can eat it. I'm not because it has a lot of lumps. I couldn't, you know. But I was driving, and, and mind you, I'm working out my own salvation daily, right? It's a daily thing. So I'm trying to be kind, and all of a sudden, I'm driving, and someone in front of me just decides to stop. So you can imagine my salvation at that moment, right? <laughs> the cake and the Lord and angels are my witness. This thing fell off like, shock. it went like that, and then it bounced back to my back seat. And I was like, Lord, I hope it's not, you know, it doesn't break. How can it break? It's a brick. <laughs> My point to you is that when we're working out our own salvation, maybe in a year I'm going to make another pound cake. Maybe I should try every once a month, and maybe they will be soft. But right now, it's a brick. It's a brick. It survived a crash. didn't even break. <laughs> so, hey, so what I'm trying to tell you is that as we come to Jesus, we have this expectation, right, that we should have it all together. You know, society says that it's not acceptable for you to have problems. Some part of the church say it's not acceptable for you to go to trials. Like, okay, have you read your Bible? Right? So as we work out our own salvation daily, then one day it's like I said, you know, you're going to be an amazing baker. Well, I told the Lord, no, thank you. I'd rather buy it. But the point to it is that as we start, it's not going to be easy. You're not going to be an expert. You're not going to be an expert at forgiving. You're not going to be an expert as, you know, praying every day. But you have to start somewhere, right? So today, I believe that we're going to have fun. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the three ingredients that we need to work out our own salvation. And without these three ingredients, I don't believe that we're able to get hold, heal, deliver, set free, and full of the wonderful things that God has for us. So I'm going to give you my first scripture. It's John 1, 14. Last Wednesday, I told you that the desire, us, the desire for, for God that he has for your life is that we are what? Fruitful, Right? You and I are here representing not only the kingdom of God, but we're representing Jesus. He left us, and he says, you know what? I am leaving you, and I'm not leaving you alone. Uh, you have the Holy Spirit with you. But as a matter of fact, I also want you to be an ambassador for me. You represent me. And I have given every ingredient that you're going to need in this, in this instructions. And the beauty of it, of the Bible, is that it's an open it's an open book task. Like, go to college, and, and then you're going to be like, you're cheating, right? Because you're like, have you seen people that write their, their answers on their hands? And God said, I'm not interested in or, or you cheating in life or, or, cutting, or getting shortcuts. I'm interested in you opening the word and knowing whatever you are that the answer is in this word. John 1.14 says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. One of the key ingredients for us to work out our own salvation, not your spouses, not your boss, not your family, not your kids, your salvation, it's grace. Grace. It says that he became flesh and dwelt among us, and he and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son, the Father, who is what? Full of grace and truth, right? It doesn't say, hey, you know, have you heard the term like when you are a couple or, or you're married and you always introduce your spouse or your fiance or whatever, you always say, uh, this is my better half, right? Have you heard that saying? 
It's a beautiful sentiment. But who wants a half a person? Right? Who wants 50%? This is my other 50%. You don't want to know the other 50. <laughs> so, and then they're little ones like, and she's my 50%, but the other 50, ooh, scary, right? <laughs> no, Jesus says, I am full of grace and full of truth. 100% full of grace. He cannot separate that. 100% full of grace and 100% full of truth. So those are the two main ingredients. But we're going to go first through grace. Are you ready? And full of grace doesn't mean, and I think a lot of people misunderstand grace because they think, you know, grace is just a license to continue sinning. But grace is actually not a license to continue sinning. Grace, when I think of grace, I'm going to tell you that grace is not earned. There's no way, no matter how good you are, no matter how wonderful you are, no matter how many chapters you read, no matter how much you pray, no matter how much you sing, no matter how much you follow a, a good living, even if you're that kind of person, good for you, but you know what? That doesn't even earn you grace. Because grace is a gift. And we don't deserve it. And he says, I am full of grace and full of truth, and you represent me, so now I am leaving you behind. you representing me, which we represent Jesus, right? So in other words, then I have to be full of grace and what? Full of truth. But I, I think we have become, we, we take sides, right? We, we like some, some chapters of the Bible. We, we talk a lot about grace, and grace, it's beautiful because the grace of God is always there for us, but the grace of God doesn't look like you think it looks like I can think of me reading the Bible and thinking just from the beginning just by me reading the way that I'm reading the Bible in a new way and I'm thinking well your grace was already effective after the fall of Adam and Eve and yet they, they need to be they need to be exposed they need to be thrown out of the the garden of, of Eden and you know what they were thrown out? Because before when I came to the Lord, all those things used to bother me. Have you ever been one of those people you, that you read the Bible, you don't understand, and you're just really pissed off? <laughs> right? I was one of those people for many years. Like, why? Why were they thrown out of the, the Garden of Eden? Why? But it's never enough the why. And I'm going to tell you now I know because they ate out of the food of knowledge, right? And they understand evil now. And then if we got to eat of the, of the fruit of life, which means eternity, they would have had to live on this earth in pain for the rest of their lives. So, so it was out of love that he had to put a, a little, a, an angel there to guard it so we can have a redemptive, a redemptive plan when Jesus will come back on this earth. He was already thinking of the love that he has for us. Grace is something that you can never get you know that how do I get grace no you don't get it it's given to you and that's good news what do you mean grace is given to me yes it's grace is given to you it's a gift that God wants you to operate in that gift not only for yourself but for others in other words grace is unconditional love and acceptance and I'm not talking that we say, you know, we're going to accept everyone. And, and you know what? It doesn't matter how you live, right? Like, just live as you please because God's going to forgive you anyways. No, because God is full of grace and full of his truth. When Adam and Eve were, were taken out of the Garden of Eden, they were left without the grace of God. No, because he didn't want to. It's because they sinned, and now it was a fallen world, and now creation was sick. So they were left only with the truth, and the truth became the law. And I am still, many times I get to meet people that they always talk about, like, that they're very truthful. Have you heard those people that are very truthful? I just want to share with you the truth. You just want to knock him down. Because their truth is hurtful because there is no grace. No, I just want to be a service of the kingdom. Have you heard those people that they just want to be a service? 
but they have all this truth and they bring scripture and they pull it apart and they give it to you but everything is law you cannot make one mistake because oh my god you're going to hell no you're not going to hell you might have a lot of repercussion because there's consequences to all of our actions but you're not going to hell we need to understand that in order to work our salvation you you have both you have the grace of God and you have the truth of God that's the essence of God God is love and he loves you he is so desperately in wanting to for you to know how much he wants you to work out your own salvation and working out our own salvation is just mean we working out our freedom working out our own salvation is me working out not only my freedom but my deliverance don't you want to just be delivered and I'm not talking being delivered of demons I'm talking being delivered on your own self of your own issues of your old self because when we come to Jesus we are new creations but just because we're new creations doesn't mean we forgot everything now I need to work out the issues from my past life I need to work out whatever was hurting me I still need to work it out and when you work it out and you invite Jesus and you invite God and you invite the Holy Spirit I'm going to tell you that the process is up to you how fast do you want it but in everything there is time Right, like today, I was opening my, my, the oven every 15 minutes. And I'm like, how do you know when it's ready? You just have to trust that it says an hour and 30 minutes. Right? But I didn't want to trust it because it looked to me that it was already burned, right? So I was like, well, it's looking burned. I should take it out. So if I decide to take it out, I'm already trying to work my own, my own path. I don't agree with the directions. How many times have you not agreed with what the word of God has to say about your life? There has been many times that I haven't agreed to it. Like, uh, I don't know, Lord, I, I like that one. I don't like that one. You could go to the garden. Remember that little when they get the, those daisies, he loves me, he loves me not, right? And depends how well you are performing because you think that salvation is to be performed. No, salvation is to be, to be lived. It depends how we feel the day or what we've done. Right? If we be nasty the day, you're like, he loves me not. <laughs> right? Okay, I'm going to tell me. Today, as I've been working my salvation, I had to do an errand, and probably I should have never gone to the, to the errand. And these people know me because I always share Jesus. And if you're watching, don't watch. <laughs> I will go back to them. But I was just demanding things that needed to be changed, right? It was an institution. I was like, you know what? You, you haven't thought of A, B, C, and D, and they, and they were very stubborn, and all of a sudden, I, I, it was like that Virginia became a Hulk. <laughs> just before I sat down, they're like, how is LFA doing? Oh, LFA is doing good. But at the end, it's how is Virginia doing? Well, I don't know about her. But at the end, I have to, like, I said, well, I'm sorry. I know this is not your fault, but just, I'm sorry. But, and then as, after I walked out of there, I was like, full of what? Full of shame. And you know that that's what happened to Adam and Eve. The moment that grace was removed when they sinned, they went into hiding. They became secretive, like they have secrets. They went into hiding. Jesus, uh, God had to go walk in the he knows where you are you know God is so amazing he exactly knows where you are and what you been, have been doing probably in the last two years one year a month or whatever even today do you know exactly that he knows where you are but yet because he's such a gentleman he's gonna ask you where are you not because he doesn't know it's because he wants you to confess him confess what you've done so then he can redeem you because our salvation has a lot of redemptive power we have been given this salvation to be redeemed. That's what Job said. My redeemer lives. Someone who lost everything in the middle of his worst time in his life. And I used to read this all the time and it used to make me really upset. Have you ever, like I told you, I already have problems, right? Reading the Bible sometimes. 
but I read Job like over and over. And I don't know about you, but I used to not dislike his wife. I did. Who disliked the wife? Be honest. Thank you for the few of you. The other ones, you guys are so awesome. But I would read it and I was like, what kind of wife is that? The man just lost his wealth, his children. Now he has boils. His friends turn on him. And now the woman is, hey, why don't you just kill yourself? But we only think about Job. And then all of a sudden I thought to myself, my God, I never, I never really looked it up in the eyes of God looking at a woman's point of view. I thought she is a mother. She just lost 10 kids in one day. One day. If my kids have problem, I'm already losing my mind. But this woman lost 10 kids. Oh, but the truth is that he, he told that he, she said, kill yourself. Curse God and just die. I mean, that's the truth, but where's the grace? Where's the grace? And you know, by reading it, I thought, my gosh, Lord, I've been full of truth in that when I read it, but now I can find the grace that I didn't even think of her pain. Not only is his husband, uh, her husband not able to work anymore, her children are gone. <coughs> and who knows how old she was? Imagine her mind is like, how am I going to bear children? I don't, I don't know. I'm thinking like, I'm very creative, like, oh my gosh. So God wants you to see your life in a different point of view. He wants you to put the, the, the glasses of salvation. These are 99 cent stores. That's why if you see my eyes really big, it's because, you know, they're not prescription. I should preach with this because I don't see you. I don't see if you're yawning or mad at me. But I'm like, when is it the time that we are going to be ready for the masses to come to know the Lord? When is it going to be the time that you and I are able to say how we feel to one another, right? We want to be planted with the Lord. We, we love the head. We love the Father. I want to be part of the Father because you and I were designed to, to live among each other. We were designed for fellowship. We were designed for connection. It's wired in our brain, and yet we only want to be connected to the Father, but we have nothing. We, we want nothing to do with the body. There is no healing unless we're connected to the body. Can I say that? Jesus said that he couldn't do anything alone. Everything that he did, he heard it from the Father. He wasn't here on planet Earth on his own plan. He was here on a plan of redemption. In his time, it was a process. Three years. Let's go to Romans 5.8. I'm going to give you a few scriptures about the grace of God so you don't forget it. So grace is unconditional love and acceptance. Write it down. Romans 5a says, but God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you know that when he died for you on the cross, when he went to the cross, do you know that he wasn't thinking about you in your best behavior? Like when he went to the cross, he probably remembered me today when I was at the bank. Why dealing with those people? Probably when he was thinking, when he went to the cross, was thinking about me in my moments that I doubted him, that he was with me. He thought about me. He thought about you at your worst, and yet he still said, I'm dying for them. I want to give them life. Galatians 1.6 says, I marvel that you are returning away so soon from him who called you into what? Into the grace of, God, of Christ to a different gospel. What gospel are you living? What gospel am I living? Am I living a gospel of grace and truth? Or am I living just one grace and then I continue to sin? There's no consequences. God forgives you and it's okay. Continue in your own life. No, he didn't die for us to continue in the same patterns. He didn't die for us to continue in the same mindsets, in the same poverty mindset. He didn't die for us to continue in the same generation of curses that we have from family to family. No, he didn't die for that. He died so you and I can taste the goodness of God. That in the middle of the storms that we can still say, my Redeemer lives. But that is real. 
that in the moments that you feel alone, you, you are able to say, no, you know what, that's a lie. But you know how hard that is if we don't train our mind. You know how hard that is if we don't take the word for what he says. The grace of God is necessary in working our own salvation. Do you know that it hurts to grow in the image of Christ? Think about it. Jesus was like, he wasn't, Jesus wasn't like we think Jesus was. Remember the, 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 the movies of Jesus back in the 90s? I remember watching that movie. I can never watch it again. It was this white guy, super sweet, right? Remember? Like with twinkle AIs, like, like he smiled 24-7. I remember whoever saw it. I saw it in 1994 or something like that. And he was just this amazing Jesus. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I can never be like him. Because he had a smile 24-7. And then Jim, Jim Caviso came, and it was like, oh, yeah, that's my Jesus. Right? Because even when the other one, even when he was turning the tables, remember when Jesus was like, uh, uh, what are you doing? This is not a, a, what do you call it? A den of thieves, right? And he, even, even when he was throwing the tables upside down, he was like, uh-huh. uh, don't do this, it's wrong. <laughs> like, there, there wasn't even a facial like expression of emotion. It's just like, uh. and I'm like, how was he human? How? And then Jim Caviso comes and he's kicking the tables. I like, you see, I can do that. I can do that, Lord. Why are we afraid of showing the real self? Do you know that I was reading this article? Guess where? No, you cannot trust Facebook. Who who did I say is my partner? Okay, you already should know. Okay, I was reading this article, right? Through Barna. But it says that a lot of people are leaving the churches and they're going to 12, 12 step programs. Do you know that? And I'm talking about the church. I'm not talking about people that do not know the world. And, and guess what? It says why they are doing that. It says because when they come to a church that they said that they belong, that you're accepted as you are. But if they try to confess something and someone says, you know what, I'm dealing with um, an addiction, then they right away, they want to change you that first day. No, you can't say that. God has delivered you. He died for you on the cross. And we start barking, right? But we want you to be part of the church because we're the body and Jesus can heal you. But then he says that, no, he went to a 12-step program. And he says, you know what freedom was for them to say? He said that it was a freedom for him to say, you know, I am struggling with A, B, C, and D. And they told them, and I thought, this is a 12-step program. It's not even a church. And they told them, you can never change unless God is involved in your life. But guess what, brother? You're not going to get to do it alone. We're going to come alongside, and we're going to help you. They're baking their cakes. They're using everything. They're, they're grabbing principles of the Bible, and some of them are Christians, some of them are not. But I'm like, for them to even acknowledge God and say, you know what? It's okay to say that. That doesn't mean you're going to be an alcoholic your, your entire life or whatever addiction you have. But it means, hey, you are not going to do it alone. There is no change without God, and we're here for you. And there is no judgment. But when you're off, we're going to tell you. I'm like, they operated in the truth and the grace of God. And they don't even know it. And we have the truth and the grace of God, and we refuse because church culture and the world culture says that our change, our transformation should be overnight. If it was true, then my cake would have been awesome. It would have been great, right? Like, I could have prayed, and believe me, I prayed for the cake. I dropped some utensils, right? Washed them. I omitted some things. I'm like, I don't like that. It says to put salt and all these things. I'm like, sweet salt doesn't go in my head. Yeah, I'm not using salt. <laughs> That's the way we do with life. You know what? I agree with this, but hey, I'm, I'm, I, don't know about, I don't know about that, Lord. 
Pero tan papa, me just walking in your grace. I rather just walk in your grace. So I forgive people and I'm kind because you know what? You you rather walk in the grace, which is not the grace of God, is because you're afraid, you're afraid of conflict. That's the reality. I can tell you for years, I was like, I thank you, Father, because you have given me such grace in my heart. Jesus, look at my heart. Boom, 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 boom. I'm like, I even have a halo. I don't know if this, like, something is going on. And I don't know. Are these wings that you're giving me? <laughs> I'm going to go in a meeting. I'm just going to smile. No. The reality is that, you know what? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell me. No, I was afraid of conflict. And I was trying to control my atmosphere. Not shifting atmospheres. Controlling my atmosphere. God has called us to shift atmosphere, not control them. And then you have people, right, that they're just like the truth and like the hammers, right? Hammer time. Tick, 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 hammer time, right? <laughs> and they're just going to be like, I'm going to tell it like it is. So here we go. Tell it like it is. I'm just going to tell it because God, I feel that God is leading me to do it through the wisdom of Holy Spirit in me. Oh, shut the hell up. No, you're just releasing hell. You just want to share your own opinion that has nothing to do with the word of God because if you don't have grace mixed with it, then you're talking by yourself and for your own self and you're living for yourself. Are we in agreement? Is this a fun message? Do I need to dance? I only know one dance, the tapatio one. Praise the Lord. <laughs> when Adam and Eve fell, the first thing that came was shame. Shame. How many of us as Christians, as sons and daughters, have you ever felt that heaviness of shame? I have. And it's not fun. So you know what decision I've made? i rather suffer for what is good and righteous than suffer in shame. And if you don't like it, bless you. Because I'm kind. Because I'm going to operate. I'm going to live out my salvation according to my Savior Jesus. And he is a man full of grace and full of truth. Right? The truth of God is, who loves structure here? Give me to all this Taipei's. Are those a Taipei's? Like, but structure, 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 right? Have you seen those people that are like, don't do this, don't do that. No, 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 my gosh. I used to be like that. I'm still a little bit like that, but better. You have to go from good to, to better, right? Or is it better, good, great, and greatest, right? I, I think I'm still good. It's okay. We go from good to great because we're working out our own salvation, right? My husband is the opposite. That man doesn't follow rules. <laughs> and I'm talking when you're going to go for a hike, don't go with him. <laughs> it says do not trespass. So I'm the truth, right? He's coming now. I'm the truth. Like, no. It says no trespassing. You cannot trespass. Who's going to see? Who's going to? My heart. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Truth, right? I'm going to touch a little nerve there. Like, he's like, it's just, a, it's not a suggestion. It says there are lions or whatever. There is the wildlife. A rabbit is wildlife for me. So I'm like, if this is going to jump, please do not. And I remember, like, and I have it on video and I should find it. But he helped me to deliver me, in a sense, because we took a vacation in Hawaii, right? And these are kids, are, they were smaller. And then he decides to go in his own trail. And he says, do not go off the trail. And I'm, you remember those cameras? Like, they were like 20 pounds. <laughs> He's leading, and I'm the camera girl there. <laughs> that he gave me for Mother's Day. Who's too much to be? 
I cried that Mother's Day. Here you go. Like, what the heck? Why would I want that? <laughs> Do you know what I did? I, I re-gifted for Father's Day. <laughs> Here you go. I was just going to be that one behind you, right? So the whole thing, he takes us for a whole hour, and he's like, let's go here. There is, I mean, I was sweating. I think the camera shaking because I was like, we need to get back. And he is like, like, no, they have the Lord. He's protecting us. And I'm like, <sighs> so the truth of God, when you study, it means the structural part of God, of his character. Do you know he's a planner? Yay, people. <laughs> Let's celebrate. He's a planner. He says operational. He's thinking. He's like, oh, let's just do it. Let's see what happens. Well, you're going to encounter a bear. He's going to eat you. <laughs> and then let's not blame it on God, right? Do you get it? Okay, that's a good part of the, of the truth, right? <clears throat> Nobody's with me on this one? Jessica de la Rosa. We should be. Who? Awesome. The truth of God leads us to what is real and accurate in Jesus. Not real to you, not real to your mama, not real to Oprah, which is awesome. I love her. But it will lead you to the accuracy of Jesus. If it's not, looks like Jesus, smells like Jesus, sounds like Jesus, it's not Jesus. I don't care how well you are convinced of this is truth. No. No, go back to the word of God. God is full of grace and truth. And let me tell you that grace without truth is not, wow, Jesus. It's just that whole path to go through living. We think is there's no consequences. I'm going to tell you that whatever you sow in this life, God says, do not be deceived. I'm not going to be mocked. He says, whatever you sow, that's what you're going to harvest. So we hear prayers that are not even in alignment with God. Lord Jesus, please, whatever seeds I did, please, can you, Holy Spirit, remove them? No, you remove them. No, you go back and address that. You go back and say, I'm sorry, Father, I missed it. Forgive me, because then guess what? You're being truthful to God, and then that's why I say, you know what? Grace is granted. But if you're just believing about carbs to be gone, no, you're going to still have the role here. I mean, that's the reality, right? And then truth without grace is pure judgment. That's what it is. You just love to judge people. Who are my judges? Nobody. They're like, not me. John 1, 16, 17 says, For out of his fullness, the superabundance of his grace and truth, we have all received. Who have received? All. Receive grace upon grace. Can you believe that God has given us grace upon grace? And he says spiritual blessing upon spiritual blessing. You feel like you have nothing. Dang, you have grace upon grace. Blessing upon blessing. Favor upon favor. And gift heaped upon gift. You're loaded. You're loaded. We're just afraid to use it or we're lazy to do it. And that's the reality, right? For the law was given through Moses, but grace, the un, what? Earn, undeserved favor of God and truth come through Jesus Christ. So if you think you owe that in a bag of chips because people say, oh, the grace of God is all over them. You You know what? It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the grace of God. It was out of the fullness. You know that he gives out of his fullness. He doesn't give out of his lack. And we give God out of our lack. Whatever I have left over, right? Like there's a lot of people, let me tell you that in the entire uh, Christianity and church experience when it comes to giving and tithing, do you know that it's only 2% around the world that tithe? Oh, well, we're expecting his fullness but you give out of your lack. How is that going to add up? And you know that God is so good that even if you get something, he most, if you give a dollar, you know he's not going to return a dollar to you. He's going to multiply it a hundredfold. So why wouldn't you trust him? Why wouldn't you work out your own salvation? 
And one thing that I have to tell you, and I know I'm closing soon, the grace of God, write this down, is uncomfortable. When God gives you grace for something, great grace doesn't make it enjoyable. We think if God gave me grace every time I preach, I shouldn't get nervous. Guess what? I do. It's not enjoyable. Do I enjoy it when I come here? Yes. But I'm saying that before coming here, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I hope I don't say this. I hope, you know, I hope I don't curse. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, you know, the crap and things, right? Hell and all the people are like, oh, she says a lot of hell. At least I say it. I don't live it, right? Throw it in throwing rocks, right? No, forgive me. But you know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. Following God is going to be uncomfortable. And if you're comfortable, you know what? Maybe you're not following God. Right? We can get to witness grace. How do you get to witness grace? Do you want to see an example of witnessing grace in the Old Testament? Is Joseph. It's like, how is that grace? You know what? That dude from a dreamer, which was awesome, right? From a dreamer, he went into the pit. From the pit, the brothers, his own family. Talk about trauma. His own family sold him as a slave. Then he finally was sold as a slave. He gets into this place and he gets accused of something that he's never done. That he ends up in prison. And then he's able to forgive. He's able to deal with his heart. Because I'm going to tell you something. He abided in the truth and in the grace of God. And that was grace in action. And think about it. It was years. Why if God was with him, why is it God that gave him a dream? Why did he go to prison? Why was he sold? Why was he deserted? Why was he abandoned? Why was he betrayed? Because just because we have God, that doesn't mean those things are not going to happen to you. But I'm going to tell you something that God is going to do. God is not going to let you die. And God is not going to let you collapse and stay there. Even if you have to crawl out of that, you will crawl out of it. I can tell you that you can crawl out of your pit. You might lose some nails. That's okay. You get fake ones. That's the way I have felt in my walk in the last three years. Like crawling out. Like. <sighs> but you know what? But God has not left me and God hasn't left you. And you need to know what grace is like. And feels like. There's people who say that I, when I see you guys and I just, you know, when you have you seen people, you see marriages or you see like great ministries, you don't know what crap they've been through. You want that? Get ready then. Get ready to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Get ready to dig around the crap. And don't stay there because he won't allow you to stay there out of his love. Paul, another one, Paul in the New Testament, he asked, he begged God three times, Lord, if you can remove this, and we don't know who, right? People always make their own, whatever. What is it that he was sin or whatever? I don't think he was sin. Because God wouldn't tell you, oh, my grace is sufficient, continue sinning. No, no, no. It had probably to do with, I don't know, depression. People said depression. So people say his past, he was tormented because of what he did to the Jews, to the Christians. So people have all this speculation, but I'm telling you something that God said, my grace is sufficient and you can do it with me. Because I'm giving it to you. Grace doesn't mean that you don't hurt. Write it down. Grace doesn't mean that you don't bruise, that you don't bleed. Grace just doesn't mean that you don't, that, like I told you, you don't die. Despising the pain, the shame. Despising the disappointment, the heartache, grace will walk you through it in the truth of God. And every day you get to get up and do it again because that is the grace of God in your life. <sighs> Come down. He has given us enough grace and no weapon form against you will prosper. But you're like, no, but I feel the weapon is stuck here. But it won't prosper. And that's why you need to know. That's the truth of God. It won't prosper. Oh, but you don't understand. I'm going through hell. I know, but it won't prosper. It's a season. And in life, there is season. And so I told you there were three ingredients. One is grace and one truth. And one more time is time. Time doesn't heal, but we need time. People doesn't change overnight. I'm not going to become an amazing baker over time. And my last scripture is in Luke 
13, 6 to 9, and I'm closing with this. And he says, then, the, then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in, the, in his vineyard. And he went to look for fruit on it, but he did not find any. So he said to the men who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found, and I haven't found any. He said, cut it down. Why should I use it, use up the soil? For three years, think about it. Every like three years. I don't know where you've been for three years and maybe nothing happens. Maybe you haven't seen any fruit. But this is the grace of God, an example that God is telling you. You know what the grace of God is that the man says? And the man is actually the one who's tending the, the fig tree. And he said, you know what? How about we give it 12 more months? He says, sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one, or, one more year. And I'll dig, up, dig it up around and fertilize it. If, if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Grace and truth in this parable are, are symbolize the actions of digging around. It's time to dig around your soil. And it's time to fertilize with your, the truth of God. And then you have to give it time. It's not a microwave world. It's not. I mean, I wish it was. Transformation comes and we work out our own salvation when we identify the lies that we have believed about our life. How many lies have you believed about you? About ourselves, about other people, and about God, and replace Him with the truth. We're talking about the tr truth, right? We're talking about working our salvation. And if we're working our salvation, we should be seeing transformation. Transformation comes when we repent of how we are coping, because we all cope in different ways. Some people are just, you see them, and then we judge them, right? Oh, because they're smoking, they're doing that, they're doing that. But you're binging on Netflix, so you're still coping, right? You're still eating chips. Oh, yeah, but that's different. No, it's not. It's your cop coping mechanism. And that will lead you to sin. Transformation comes when we forgive those who hurt us. And we are not longer in bondage to those who've left wounds on our souls. Do you know how hard that is? But I'm going to tell you that it's doable with the grace of God and the truth of God and the time of God. Because his time is redemptive. Transformation comes when people love us and accept us as we are so we can be courageous to deal with our own stuff and cooperate with God in the changing healing process of our great salvation. Even Jesus went to the process and he was three years. Three years, right? He talked about that fig tree, three years. And then he says, after the three years, guess what? I feel like we've been in this season of three years. And God gave me an award, and I think it was in April. I think it was in April. He, he said, I'm giving you a 12 months turnaround. And I believe that that's a prophetic word for all of us. Maybe for three years, you've been going around the, around the mountain. Here we come, right? And we haven't seen anything because you've been doing it alone. Or maybe because you only chose grace, but you didn't, you didn't mix it with the, with the truth of God. No, today we need to make a choice and to say, you know what? I'm going 100% with the truth of God and with the mercy of God. And I'm going to give time to my God because everything happens in God's timing. And he's not a microwave. Right? Yeah. I want to add something to this, please. Because you're talking about, and I love that verse. If you can put the last verse that you guys had up for her. Uh, why should it? Use up the soil, sir. The man replied, Just leave it alone for one more year. Ever say one more year? One more year. He says, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. In other words, something wasn't working. Just something wasn't working. I really believe that the word you're saying is true. I believe there's people sitting here, and you know right now there's something that's not working in your life. It could be your be your marriage it's just not working it could be your your finances it could be the uh, investments are just not working you're you're listen you have more month than you do money something's not working but notice that in the scriptures you find so much insight and wisdom all your answers are in the word of god and I love how you talked about patterns because there's a perfect example of a man who we know him as Timothy.
Paul knew him as the struggling pastor. Timothy was a struggling pastor. You know what Timothy's pattern was? What was his pattern? If anybody knows the word, what do you think his pattern was? Fear. He was always afraid. He had a lack of confidence to step up to the plate and do what God called him to do. And so Paul comes to him and he has a conversation with struggling Timothy. And he says this to him as you were, I've been listening the whole time in the back. This is uh, in 2 Timothy, write this down, 1, 13 through 14, and then I want us to pray tonight. It says, follow what you heard from me as the pattern of true teaching. As the what? Pattern. So, so he's, telling, he's telling Timothy, Timothy, you obviously have a pattern that keeps leading you to fear. There's a pattern in your life that keeps leading you to fear of, of, of failing, fear of success, fear of, of trying, fear of trusting. And he says, if you keep reading this, it says, so follow the pattern of true teaching, okay? True teaching, the gospel, the true teaching. And he says, follow it with faith. Everybody say it with faith. You gotta, listen, you can't create a, a pattern without faith. There's no such, there's no such thing. You take faith, so many of us are trying to change without faith. No, faith is the main ingredient. He says, follow it with faith and love because you belong to Christ Jesus. Guard the truth of the good news that you were trusted with. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. So you're not alone. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. So as I'm hearing my wife speak, as I'm reading this verse and I'm hearing, I love that last verse she read. The, the truth is this, is that you cannot pray away a problem. You cannot pray away a pattern. You have to change the pattern in order for you to change the problem. So if you're someone that's always discouraged, follow the pattern. If you're someone that's always disappointed, locate the pattern because the pattern is what's bringing you to disappointment. If you're always depressed, there's a pattern to your depression. There's something, there's a pattern, a cycle that my wife said, it's like going around the mountain, going around. You know what? You want to change the problem? Change the pattern. Last thing, I'll say this, and I want you to pray. I want to call people up because David had a big, big problem. Does anybody here have a problem tonight? Anybody have any problems? Work problems, school problems, financial health problems. Anybody have a problem? Okay, well, let me tell you something. David had a huge problem. His name was Goliath. You guys remember that? So he saw this huge problem, Goliath. And David recognized that there was a pattern with the children of Israel. You know what their pattern was? They were too afraid to fight. They were too afraid to trust God. They were too afraid to step into their promise. Why? Because a Goliath kept confronting them and keeping them from entering into what God said is yours. So you know what David did? He said, we're going to change the pattern. How did he change the pattern? Well, he fought Goliath with Goliath's own sword and killed him. What am I saying? You want to change your problem? Change the pattern. Use that very pattern that's been literally causing you aches and pains and hurt and use it against the enemy. Take the sword that was trying to take you out and use it against the enemy and let's go ahead and fulfill everything God's called us to be. Amen. Come on, we got to step up and change the pattern. Stand to your feet real quick. Stand to your feet. And I love that verse because it says start digging around. Well, if you want to change your pattern, you got to dig. You got to dig. What's what's your pattern? I want you to just think about this for a second. What what pattern do you need to change right now? You know what? If you're angry, there's a pattern. If you're frustrated, there's a pattern. If you're always anxious, well, there's a there's something that has literally brought you to that place of anxiety. There's a pattern. Listen, locate the pattern. You want practical? You go back to the word. Paul made it very clear to Timothy. He says, you go back to the truth. You go back to what we know. The gospel.
gospel of Jesus Christ. And I know that there's many of, many of us here that right now you're probably facing something, okay? All of us here. And it doesn't have to be something out there so far-fetched and so, you know, huge that you're in sin. But you know what? How many know that depression is real? Anxiety is real. But I promise you there's a pattern of why you're feeling that way. I promise you there's a pattern. Here's, here's, this is free 99. Start logging your day. Log it. Write it down throughout the day. I double dog dare you. Grab a notebook and log your day and you'll find your pattern. And you'll realize it's probably someone you've been talking to a lot every single day. That becomes the trigger to your anxiety. Maybe it's your workplace. I don't know. Or maybe it's you. You're always letting your mind run. Log it. Look for the pattern. Then come back to the truth. And you combat the lie with God's word. And his word never fails. Do you still believe that? He told Timothy, you do this by faith. By faith. Let's lift our heads to heaven. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you because you are so good and so great and so awesome. Because not only did you give us a helper, the Holy Spirit, but you give us the word, Father, for every season of our life. Seasons of doubt, seasons of fear, seasons of, of chaos and uncertainty. There's an answer for all of it, Father. I pray that there would be a, a divine hunger of your word for us to be students of your word and search the truth so that we no longer have to make excuses of why we're depressed, of why we're anxious, of why we're angry, of why we're frustrated, but that we would be the Davids of this generation that take on the Goliaths and we take the sword of the enemy and with that same sword, we chop the head off of whatever is stealing our peace, our joy, our strength, our vision, our dreams. And Father, I ask you in the mighty name of Jesus that we will do the work. We see and we heard the message. There's a process. Lord, give us the tenacity. Give us the wisdom. Give us the hunger. Give us the fight to dig around our fruit, our, our plant, our tree, so that we can bear much more fruit, so that we can grow and change and see the glory of the Lord upon us. Thank you, Father God, for this word and season. Thank you, Jesus, that tonight when we get home, Father, we're going to take a knee and we're going to really seek you and say, Father, I'm giving you this anxiety. I'm giving you this fear. And you're going to be faithful, Father, to respond. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.